here with Gavin Wood today. Uh, you're one of the core developers of Ethereum, That's right. and uh, we're going to talk about Ethereum. We're going to talk about a whole bunch of things. How did you first get involved in the Ethereum project? What is so alluring about Ethereum to you? Um, well, I was I was given the uh, link to the white paper by a friend of mine, um, who was also a mutual friend of Vitalik, the guy who wrote uh, the white paper in the first place. So, um, having read it, I thought, yeah, this is a pretty interesting sort of uh, proposal. Um, I saw a few rough edges, but I thought it'd be really uh, a really cool idea to try and uh, implement, just to test it out and see what, what was mm -hmm. possible. Yeah, one of the things that's interesting about Ethereum is that it's the first, not the first, there have been meta layer protocols, like things like MasterCoin and things like uh, BitShares and ProtoShares and all of that. Um, but Ethereum takes a different approach in its Turing completeness. Um, what has that been like for you? Because there's a certain amount of sandboxing that needs to be done. Yeah, I mean, the Turing completeness can be viewed as a bit of a red herring. Actually, with Ethereum, one of the most important things, probably the most important thing, also with the Turing completeness, is the fact that you can have arbitrary storage, you can store arbitrary states, you can remember arbitrary things between transactions in the same account. Um, so whereas with Bitcoin, basically that state is whether it's spent or it's spent, kind of a Boolean thing. Um, with Ethereum, it's it's basically as arbitrary as what you want to pay for, as much as you want to pay for. So um, that. Of course, you can change the state in arbitrary ways, that's where the Turing completeness comes in, but really, if you have to get rid of either Turing completeness or arbitrary state, probably get, to get rid of the Turing completeness and have a, a limited set of programs that you can run, but still be able to store anything you want between the transactions. Gotcha. And what kind of variables would be stored in between transactions? Absolutely anything that can go into the computer's memory. So, um, uh, you know, to take the obvious thing, uh, uh, amounts in accounts. So, you've got this much gold coin, I've got this much gold coin, whatever. Um, really, it's it's uh, we're talking at such low levels in the same way that you sort of talk about computer programs, where the computer programs store the computers memory, they store all sorts of things. Um, it, it's entirely application specific. Okay, cool. Uh, now you're doing the C plus plus side of the development. Yeah. yeah that's right. Okay, cool. How's that been going? What's the progress? Because I've been using Alice Zero for a little while now, okay. and uh, I think it's pretty cool. It's got some neat little features and whatnot. Um, how's it been for development? Yeah, we've been we've been progressing at quite a pace. Okay. Um, we've had a contract in for well, we've been using it for a while. We've had it for about a month and a half now. Um, so you can write your own contract and, and, and push it to the blockchain. It's got networking, so you can do pretty much everything that you can do um, with Bitcoin, but you've got you know, this additional sort of ability to sort of stay. Uh, that's cool. We've just put in things like a debugger. But we're getting in a new high-level language, so uh, no writing in um, uh, the language that computer science students get taught in the first year. Or, you know, something that will blow your mind with all the parentheses and uh, very difficult sometimes. But um, yeah, we're we're really sort of pushing it along, trying to flesh out all of the uh, key components of the proposal, um, and at the same time uh, refine the protocol in order to make it um, something reasonably hard to do. First version before we sort of bring in more of the sort of esoteric things that we're looking into uh, or hoping to at least over the next year. So, what kind of contracts are uh, available now, or what are what are things that you're seeing people starting to gravitate towards design? Um, the one thing that seems so, I personally, I'm I'm kind of into uh, I wanted to launch a currency and I wanted to see uh, the sort of name registration stuff. So uh, that was the first thing I did. Relative because it's relatively simple. Um, right, yeah. exactly. Yeah, it's going to be big. <laughs> um, but one of the things that I've, I've noticed recently, um, so two of the projects we have at the hackathon, uh, one of them is the sort of uh, Satoshi Dai style thing, so uh, you know, some kind of a gambling thing based on um, provable randomness, pseudo randomness over the blockchain. Um, the other is uh, a more interesting thing where we can take um, and use the blockchain in order to arbitrate whether um, a door lock should work on. So what we can do is we can automate the notion of a, a key card um, remotely. So um, maybe it, the, there's, there's a, a contract on the blockchain that determines, hey, if you pay money to me some set amount, um, I will uh, take your public identity and I will make sure that that, that, that lock on that door, uh, maybe it's an Airbnb that you're renting, or maybe it's an office space, whatever, uh, I'll make sure that that um, unlocks for you on the provider. That can also be used for things like Zipcar or for like little car rentals where you go up with the phone and you can access them. That's very cool. 
What are, I mean, from the perspective of um, somebody who's designing being designed, oh, but to set the record function, straight, not every that can generalize either, how is that structure set up? Yeah, so in the same way that with Bitcoin, you have to pay um, some relatively small amounts in order to have the network. Basically, you're paying the network to take to take note of your transactions, and to store it, and to uh, pass it around through the main effect. Um, it, so it's the same with, with Ethereum. So um, depending on how much computation you, your transaction takes in order to change for the, the, the previous state of the new state, so to change the door from being unlocked to locked, vice versa, um, uh, that is how much that you must pay the miner, so the network in effect, um, in order to uh, to compute that and to record uh, the, the right information. Gotcha. And how do you handle loops? Um, so although the language in a sense is true and complete, and that there can be loops that can be sort of a, a problem, you know, while true, just carry on going and it goes forever. Um, actually, it's not true. It's quasi true. The reason it's only quasi true and complete is because we, uh, we insist that the fee must be paid for each computational step. And so we sort of uh, built into the formal protocol um, the, the, um, the requirement that it halt, and it's an absolute requirement. There is no way that you can um, uh, change the amount of computational uh, steps that it's allowed to do after the fact that it's started executing. And so this is the sort of the, the key sort of uh, silver bullet that we have to uh, to, to get rid of the problem of Turing completeness in terms of uh, the issue of uh, indefinite execution. Yeah, so basically it would execute so long as there's funds to carry it. That's in effect. And um, what the key thing is as well, that rather than, well, then you've got the thing of, well, what if I can somehow make a program that keeps getting me more funds, then surely I can execute uh, uh, to an extended state. And of course, what we, what we say is, well, no, because um, you must pay for the amount of execute, the amount of computation you want to do up front. Gotcha. And so nice. it's very much bounded on that on that value that you set initially. Okay, cool. So tell me about some of the ecosystem ideas that are being fleshed out because one of the things that's interesting about Ethereum and uh, because of the way that the, the launch is being done, the idea is to launch with a few different platforms. So I mean we've all heard decentralized storage, we've heard decentralized exchange. How do those or even other ideas factor into the launch of Ethereum? Um, well, I guess launching Ethereum, it'd be fair to say, is a bit like the launch of any other software platform. So, uh, whether you take the iPhone, uh, which, if you remember, actually launched without an app store, it was just a, a bunch of apps. You know, Apple only brought in the app store, um, or the launch of the console, the PlayStation, and yeah, they come with launch titles. So, and the, really, what is a console without the launch titles? If it launches with no real games to play, then yeah, it's a useless bit of electronics until someone gets it out. So uh, we don't want to fall into that trap of Ethereum. We don't want to sort of launch and say, oh, this is potentially brilliant, but we can't actually show you anything. Um, so uh, yeah, we're going to be working with, uh, we're going to obviously uh, develop our own uh, launch applications, but we're also going to be working with and encourage others to develop their launch applications. And we want to try and sort of support that and bolster that we want to make uh, when we do launch it's sort of a big thing. Hey, look, you can do this and this and this and this now. But you just couldn't do it. One of the things that I'm excited to see is decentralized exchange. It's, I, I almost feel like we've gotten too far into uh, the Bitcoin life cycle or the cryptocurrency life cycle to not have those, you know, especially when they're charging fees and we see funds go missing and all sorts of things. Um, how do you envision decentralized exchange in the future? Are you going to have a wallet that supports multiple coins and you can exchange between your wallet or what, what is the best protocol for that? Uh, decentralized exchange is an interesting one. My own personal feelings on this is that it's going to be handled by a mixture of technologies, of which uh, Ethereum will be one, I expect. Um, but one of the other things that I want to see, and it may well be its own project, it may well be even part of Ethereum, is a, um, a decentralized, anonymous, identity-based uh, message packet uh, communication system. So the idea would be that um, you have a network of peer peers and um, each peer would, would encrypt, would, would determine the message they would send, they would encrypt it with the receiver's key, and then potentially encrypt it with their own sign of their private key if they wanted the message to So just sort of fairly standard with the key infrastructure. And then what they do is they pass it into the network um, via an encrypted connection to a bunch of peers, um, and thus sort of preventing any eavesdropping from the 
begin to know where any particular message came from. And then they would, um, through a, a self-organizing adaptive network infrastructure, a peer network infrastructure, would, would, pass the net, would pass the message on until they got to a, a peer that had the identity of the <coughs> codec. Of course, they'd know it before then. And, um, and then they'd be able to read it, and they'd be able to pass it back again. And through, uh, the idea is that the, the peer network would, would re, uh, readjust in order to, um, uh, so each node would, would find the peers that were most likely to give it messages that it were interested in. And so with this, you kind of got this kind of idea of the internet, but the internet within the internet that would, um, that, that would have to be secure, and it would be anonymous, and it would be uh, uh, encrypted in, in a useful sense, so you'd be able to uh, talk to people without uh, knowing that you were being listened to, without yeah. possibility. Yeah. Now, how do you feel about the recent uh, security SSL part of the situation? What are your thoughts on that? Oh my God. Yeah. What was that about? Um, I mean, I guess that was big news. Mm -hmm. It was big news. I think it took uh, most people by surprise. Yeah, it did. Uh, and wow, their icon. I mean, they couldn't have marked it that, that better if they'd have uh, if they'd have tried. It was. It, was, it really got my attention. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, I, I think that it's excellent that, the, the speaking of Bitcoin, they patched it up. The exchanges have seemed to be patching things up. Um, in fact, it's nice to see that such fast, rapid changes can occur when you have a community-based system like that. Um, is that going forward? I mean, are there any considerations for Ethereum and, and that kind of, Has that changed anything from your perspective, Cody? Um I suspect that um, errors such as the heartbeat bug are going to be very, very difficult to detect. I mean, the fact that OpenSSL has had it in for how many, one and a half, two years yeah. now, uh, with it being detected is, uh, is evidence of that. So I'm not sure uh, really how that can be um, addressed up front, except by processes, like you say, um, uh, the community processes that were, that were there. That, um, you know, address it as soon as possible and you know kind of keep it under wraps for the um, whatever two three five hours that it takes to actually uh, uh, deliver a decent bug fix and then um, blast it out to all and sunder in order to get everybody to a great and really sort of propel the the importance of this i was slightly surprised that the national press didn't make a bigger thing of it when it came out i didn't have <coughs> any problem with that at all i mean it's, this is a, something that affects the entire internet it's the secrecy and security of the entire internet yeah, I agree. So let's change pace. Let's talk about the Ethereum product sale or the, the rollout, whatever we want to term it. Um, how is that going to work? I mean, it's going to happen soon. So people are going to be able to, using um, specific wallets, buy Ether. Is this correct? And how does that process take place? Because Ethereum hasn't launched yet. And so the Ether that they're buying will be kind of like uh, standard Ether, if you will. Can you walk us through that process? Sure. So um, basically, we're we're going to uh, launch the the ether sale. So this is a, this will be effectively a currency swap for promises to pay ether like, on the launch um, for Bitcoin now. And the Bitcoin is basically just going to be used to pay for the uh, the development of the uh, of the platform and to uh, put some aside for future investment in uh, in later versions of Ethereum and also cryptocurrency in general. Um, the, loan, the, the purchase of Ether will take place through the website uh, that they're in. So you'll be able to, we're sort of working on getting a really nice sort of um, experience uh, for that. Um, and initially, there'll be a, a, a preferential rate in terms of uh, what the exchange between uh, Bitcoin and Ether will be um, that will, uh, as time goes on, sort of go down. So, you know, early adopters will be accordingly compensated. Um, yeah, in terms of the, the you know what you get now, what you affect, what you get is a promise. What you get is is, is a receipt that basically says, yeah, when 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 Ethereum launches in the Genesis block, you know you will get your key will, will actually unlock this okay. this amount of Ether, and you'll be free to spend as you choose. Gotcha. Okay. And what exchanges are you planning? I mean, are, is it going to be launched on exchanges? Do you know which exchanges? Yeah, we'll have we'll have, have uh, we'll have at least one major exchange on okay. launch. Um, we're still in talks, so I can't really. Yeah, yeah, I think that's fine. Okay, yeah. okay cool. Um, we're going to open it up to questions as well. If people have questions, by all means, you can just raise your hand. Go ahead. 
What's the difference in gas and ether? Um, um, gas is effectively an internal term used um, by the protocol in order to um, abstract the idea of this computational uh, unit. Um, before, in the original white paper, there was notion of the base fee, which was the um, amount of ether. Well, it's actually a denomination of ether, but an amount of ether that you had to pay to do one computational step. And there are a number of other pieces of computation that were multiples of that, and that's why it was the base. Um, well, what we did for the for the latest idea of the protocol is to sort of um, get rid of the notion of a, of a multiplier and just say, right, well, there's there is um, there is a this thing called gas, it only lives within inside, uh, within the, uh, the execution environment. So you never trade it, you never own it or anything like that. Uh, but what you do is you, um, at the beginning, or when you, when you want to transact with the network, you offer a price um, that you're willing to pay in terms of ether for a unit of gas. And the gas is what you buy um, at the beginning of the execution um, in order to uh, power your program. So it's effectively the number of steps that you um, and any gas that isn't used, so any steps that aren't taken by the time of the transaction. So in effect, all you do is reconvert it back to the you know, amount according to the presentation that you want to pay for. Um, does it have is, does it have a parallel in, in Bitcoin, some analog in Bitcoin? What would it be analogous to? So gas itself is the the closest analog is the transaction fee, but it's it's not an especially good one because. Um, in Bitcoin, it's not, um, it doesn't scale, it's not a multiple sort of scale. Um, in Ethereum, it, uh, that's precisely what it does. Um, the gas price, if you like, is the transaction fee that you offer the miner. And then, then it's, it's a bit of a better analogy, because miners are free to uh, ignore transactions if the, if the transaction fee is free to switch. Yeah, they can ignore them for whatever reason they want, but if the transaction fee is too low, then that's, that's pretty guaranteed by getting a, a miner to it. Um, so it's the same. If the, if the gas price is too low, it's just not worth their effort to uh, to do that computation of the transaction. I've got a question about data storage. So um, it seems that with Ethereum, you have the ability to store uh, arbitrary data, you know, as contracts, uh, more, more so than it's uh, than what I've seen in Bitcoin, and that led me to wonder. Um, will nodes who want to participate in the Ethereum network, uh, will they have to um, uh, be responsible for storing all of the data in the Ethereum network? Uh, I think with Bitcoin, there's like, if, you know, there's, and if, you, if you're a full node blockchain, you have to have all of the data. Uh, and it seems that like that's an inherently non-scalable model. And so are there any like mechanisms to like shard data throughout the network, like a consistent hashing or, or something to that effect? Um, there won't be anything built into the protocol. However, contracts will be able to uh, have their own uh, off-chain um, storage protocols that they can effectively police within the contract. So the example, the decentralized Dropbox uh, is not going to store all the data on chain. Uh, we said it would be far too expensive for a start because the uh, 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 I think around 32 bytes of storage is uh, costs around 100 uh, gas, which will be it's like 100 execution steps. It's, it's not something you want to pay for if you're doing megabytes. Um, so the contract it would be up to the contract to basically um, arbitrate that off-chain storage um, through its own um, logic. So, uh, so. In, in practical terms, like what does that mean? Like, how, how do like do you store pointers, URLs, references? Like, how, how, how do you connect those contracts then to the external data source? Realistically, it would be a hash. So you store a hash that says, "I want the data that hashes to this value," and you store a hash on the blockchain, and that's how you know that when you go into the external source, you got the right data. I see. So client programs that are responsible for reading transactions and using that hash to somehow locate the data themselves yes. using protocols like violence, balance of access, or HTTP or whatever. Oh, all right. Or, 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 right. What's your team's uh, thoughts on the two-way peg to the sort of uh, thoughts of the side chain? Uh, it's an interesting proposal. I mean, we're still sort of uh, chatting about it at the moment, relatively sort of a new thing. But um, we've we've kind of had talks about um, similar mechanisms in the past, and 
Although for Ethereum 1, it's probably not likely to be uh, something that we're going to explore too, too much. We really want to sort of have an expedited release. Um, for Ethereum 2, we're, we're probably going to be looking into uh, this sort of thing. And it's something that we're going to pay for research in as well. I mean, it's, as it stands, it's probably not immediately um, usable um, with Ethereum, simply because the state transition function is so complex. Uh, but into the future, there may well be ways around around the ways of addressing it in order to get the scale of the little bit. Yeah, I would imagine that it wouldn't be too hard to bridge back over in a 2.0 version. So since you're paying for every computational step, it would make sense to uh, store the, most, the results of the most frequently used steps for large data sets. So if you have encrypted data that's stored in, say, storage, um, wouldn't you have to have another storage that is unencrypted where the data gets decrypted so that a computation can be performed on it and then needs to be communicated with back and forth. So how do you keep end-to-end -end encryption going with that setup where you're needing to have stored computation and your data set that you're performing the computation on unencrypted during the computation? Oh, I see. Um, so for the data storage, you wouldn't do the computation on that data. So the data storage would be pure data storage. It would happen off chain. Um, and you wouldn't use the Ethereum network's power in order to do computation. For a start, it would be far too expensive. Um, if the Ethereum network would be used for um, a transaction logic that is um, incredibly sensitive in terms of um, the uh, notion of consensus. So it's, lo it's the logic that needs to happen in order that we agree on the ramifications. But it's not for general compute. You never ever use it for So you would never do any computation on a large data set using the Ethereum network thing. Uh, uh, we're kind of trying to use a, a, a jeweler's drill in order to you know, drill for coal. It's, it's kind of, um, it's the wrong sort of thing. Okay. Uh, if you're looking at the Ethereum network, you can Is this different to provable computation? Because you said consensus computation. Yeah, well, uh, if we can get um, proof of computation. So this isn't something that you know, we're going to get in the next three to four months, which is our release, what, really kind of what we're aiming for with version one. Uh, but yeah, going to the future, um, if it can be made to work, and if we can get, you know, if it's open source, if we can like, really build it into the, the project, then it's going to change a lot of things. Cool. Any other questions? Go ahead again. Would, would you mind elaborating a little? You, you mentioned in the white paper um, three approaches: uh, building a new blockchain, using scripting on top of Bitcoin, and building a meta protocol on top of Bitcoin. And could you add maybe the side chain uh, possibilities and sort of elaborate on on the advantages and disadvantages of those different categories? Uh, that's quite a complex <laughs> answer. Um, so again, the sidechain proposal relatively uh, short. I mean, for a start, there's no um, uh, concrete um, sort of code that has been submitted yet to the sort of thing. So uh, we still really need to sort of discuss the ramifications of that. But um, I can see at the moment. For, the, for, for version one, we really just want to uh, get ahead and implement the, the protocols and stacks. And then looking forward into two, so in the next sort of maybe 12 to 18 months, which should be roughly a sort of time spot that we want for uh, building the second version. Um, it may well it may well form a, an important force, but maybe it won't. It's uncertain.